All right. Once again, thank you for joining AMSEC today um, for the webinar, Challenging the Status Quo on Oxygenation. Oh, I knew I was going to mess this up. Sorry, everyone. Challenging the Status Quo on Oxygenation, brought to you by um, Abbott. Attendee videos and microphones have been turned off for today's webinar. If you have any questions for the presenters, please be sure to enter them into the chat or the Q&A section on your screen. I will now pass things off to Fiaz Mohammed, a CUTE MCS Marketing Manager from Abbott. Thank you, everyone, and welcome. So before we get started, just wanted to uh, go through a few housekeeping notes. So the contents in this call do represent the beliefs of the speakers, do not necessarily represent the views of Abbott. The speakers are presenting at the request and on behalf of Abbott, honoraria is being provided this meeting is not intended for CEU credits and support for the program is being provided by Abbott. If there are any questions, as Tori has mentioned, um, we would ask that you place all of your questions into the chat and we will get to these questions and have a formal Q&A session at the end of the uh, presentation. So if you don't have to hold your questions until that time, at any point, please submit your questions so that when we do get to that Q&A, the speakers are uh, ready to answer those questions. Today's program will focus on ECLS oxygenation, specifically how the Eurosets AMG PMP oxygenator is challenging the status quo when it comes to oxygenation. We have the pleasure of hearing from two speakers today, Dr. Lucian Durham and Mr. Flavio Cavallari. Dr. Durham is a highly skilled surgeon, decades of experience uh, with VADS, heart transplantation, and he's currently the director of the MCS, the ECMO, and the cardiogenic shock programs uh, at Fred Ertz and the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Also at that institution is Mr. Flavio Cavallari. Um, Flavio is a certified clinical perfusionist. Uh, who is currently the cardiopulmonary perfusion manager at Fred Ert and the Medical College of Wisconsin. Throughout his career, Mr. Cavallari has played a pivotal role in developing numerous ECMO programs, is involved in training individuals, mentoring individuals, uh, creating case management plans, and also running simulations. He's uh, hailing from Italy and has been uh, has extensive experience utilizing the Eurosets AMG oxygenator. So we're very much looking forward to hearing both Dr. Durham and Mr. Cavallari's experience at Fred Ert. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to you, Dr. Durham, to walk us through uh, how the AMG oxygenator uh, has challenged the status quo at your institution. Okay, let's see if I... All right, let's see if I can share my screen. Hopefully everybody can see this. We do. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, as the, as Fia said, contrary to what may be under your screen, I'm not Fia. My name is Buck Durham. I am the director of MCS ECMO and Cardiogenic Shock here at MCW. Um, and um, what we looked at, if I can get my slides to change. For us, pandemic and post-pandemic supply chain related issues and back order status led us to evaluate additional oxygenators for our ECMO program because we needed to ensure a steady supply and availability. Before we had pretty much been married to the Quadrox oxygenator as I think it was probably the most commonly used oxygenator. And given that, um, our two platforms were the CardioHelp and the Centromag, which now um, we're essentially 100% Centromag based. Um, we use that as our typical oxygenator. But again, when it got back ordered and we started having an issue with supply chain, it concerned us because we were getting patients like everybody else was pretty fast and furious. So we started looking at oxygenators and we decided to, we were, had looked at McKay, um, the, because of our experience with Abbott um, and our utilization of the 
Centromag and PDMag systems. Um, we evaluated the AMG PMP oxygenator as well as the Soren uh, EOS system. The Soren was not really readily available to us, um, but for comparison's sake, we we evaluated it just to make sure we were making a reasonable decision. In comparing the devices, um, McKay. The Quadrox had kind of set the bar since that was what we were currently using. And as you can see in this table, um, blood flow ratings were five liters per minute for both the Soren and the McKay system. They were seven liters per minute for the AMG. Priming volumes were fairly high for the Quadrox um, and lowest for the Soren system. The AMG hit almost right in the middle. But if you look at the surface area, surface area of 1.3 and 1.2 meters for the Quadrox and the Soren respectively didn't compare well with the 1.81 square meters of surface area for the AMG. Pressure drop was lowest with the McKay. Um, it was 150 and I, we compared them all at five liters since that was the rated flow for the other oxygenators. And you can see here, it was 48 for the Quadrox, 150 for the AMG, and 230 for the EOS. Um, CO2 transfer, again, was fairly com comparable across the, you know, across the spectrum, um, as was the oxygen transfer. Oxygen transfer at 280, 300, and 315 while our CO2 transfer was in the mid 200s and as low as 200 for the EOS. Um, the Quadrox is a polypropylene uh, system with a polyurethane coating, while both the AMG and the EOS were polymethylpentene with phosphorylcholine uh, coating. The coating, both the poly Urethane and the phosphorylcholine um, are merely hydrophilic interfaces for the blood plastic interface. Causes it decreases inflammation and platelet activation primarily. So we chose to go with the AMG and our AMG use throughout the pandemic and post-pandemic. Um, our N was sixty-nine patients. 43 male, 26 female. Mean age was 56.4 um, with an age range from 14 to about 74 was our cutoff. 28 were VA, 19 were VV, and 22 were VPA or kind of an RVAD configured ECMO. Um, Mean hours, 214 hours, so just short of nine days was our mean run. And you can see the patient weights range from 59 to 147 kilos with a mean of roughly 90 kilos. Our BMI seemed low to us we because most of the patients we seem to deal with are in the 38 to 44 range, but uh, our BMI averaged out at 30.2 the range of 18.7 to um, almost 48. We had no acute failures and we had no changes at less than two weeks. Uh, most of our changes were elective based on uh, pre and post operative or post oxygenator gases. If post oxygenator gas got much below 150, we generally changed it out. Um, and what we've subsequently found is CO2 probably guides us more than anything. And while it's somewhat empiric, um, our longest went 59 days. Um, with, the with the pressure drop being a little higher than the quadrax, we typically run our circuits uh, about 200 cc's a minute faster to account for the prior, the higher pressure drop across the oxygenator. It's run well with little to no anticoagulation. We exclusively use bivalrudin here, typically running a PTT of 35 to 45 seconds. However, we've run 
probably 25 to 30 percent of our patients with no anticoagulations because we've become more of a center for a lot of pregnant women. And so um, we try to run them with low to no anticoagulation. Uh, we also use very low anticoagulation to stave off any complications, uh, particularly those that we saw during the pandemic, which were mainly oropharyngeal or GI bleeding. We had no, we've had no serious adverse events on the AMG oxygenators and have been very pleased with, with how they run for us. Um, we've even started in some of the younger patients who get very active or uh, agitated, um, we've run uh, twin oxygenators where we'll splice in a second oxygenator in parallel. We've seen no additional pressure drop and the twin oxygenators have really helped us as far as dropping really the, the CO2. And that's why I say our CO2 removal has become more of an indicator for us as far as weaning uh, towards decannulation. I think I just killed mine, but that was that was what I had, and I'd uh, be happy to flip it over to uh, Flavio and let him share the rest of it with you, which will probably be more meaningful for y'all than what I've done, but this is how we went about choosing the AMG oxygenator as, a, as an alternative and now almost um, exclusively what we're running. Thank you so much, Buck. I'm going to share my screen just one sec. There we go. So let me close this. There we go. Uh, so first, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Flavio Cavallari. I'm the cardiopulmonary perfusion manager at the Frederick and the Medical College of Wisconsin. Uh, be presenting the AMG oxygenator, uh, our clinical experience, and the best practices. Uh, the first part of these slides will cover the AMG oxygenator future characteristics and components. Meanwhile, the second part would be more focused on uh, my team uh, clinical experience practice. And the goal of this presentation is you to walk away with answers to commonly asked questions and greater confidence to use this oxygenator. Uh, let me see if I can go, here we go. So this, uh, as you know, this is the EMG oxygenator and let's give a quick review. We have different components here. We have uh, a purge line, uh, presence of, there is an integrated stainless steel heat exchanger and as you can see, water inlet and outlet. A uh, quick thing about the perch line, uh, the idea of this oxygenator was also used for cardiopulmonary bypass. So having this perch line was really useful to run, for example, the cardioplegia or have an additional uh, recirculation line. So this is why uh, there is a presence of this perch line, but also might be useful uh, for um, for you if you want to run additional uh, devices. We don't usually use it. We keep it clamped after priming it. And, um, and we also can see in this slide different lure connection, like the plug inlet lure connection, the plug outlet lure connection. And as Dr. Durham said, this uh, oxygenator is made of polymethylpentene fibers with PC coating. Uh, Technical characteristic, prime volume 220, contact surface area 1.81 square meters. Something that I found really interesting in these pictures, I, as you can see on the bottom of the oxygenator, uh, there is um, the blood inlet as a different angles compared to the other oxygenators as a 45 degrees angle. Just keep it, this part in mind and we'll go through this later. Um, so the blood goes through the heat exchanger first and then spread out across the membrane fibers. I found really useful and really comfortable to use this oxygenator with a Centrimax system transporter. 
and it's very compact compared to the using the quadrox ox oxygenator. And I'm sure that if you're going to use the Centromag pre-connected pack, you'll find the same oxygenator that you can uh, use when you transfer your patient from an outside hospital. Uh, let's jump on our clinical and perfusion practice. Um, most of the time, we receive the, uh, myself and my team receive this question, how we assess oxygenator status. And uh, also definition of performance says that performance is considered adequate if the device meets manufacturer specified capacity. And uh, as Dr. S Dr. Durham showed you before, um, the Aerosets AMG oxygenator is able to have very good around three, 300, 350 millimeters per minute oxygen transfer capacity. So it's really still in a good range. Uh, but we don't make a decision to change out the oxygenator only uh, considering the OCHO transfer. We also consider all aspects of the patient's status before making this decision. Uh, fun fact, we had a patient on ECMO with the Aerosex MG. The post-oxy was very low, and uh, it had been low for uh, almost two weeks, around 160, and we didn't make the decision to change out the oxygenator. Instead, we decided to measure the pre-oxy PO2, which was very low. And now the patient, we went through all the ECMO procedure with the same oxygenator and the patient was decanylated this morning, successfully decanylated this morning. So made your decision, not only based on the numbers, but based on the patient's needs on, and everything that's happening around the patient. That's not the only way that we assess the oxygenator. We also have visual inspection. At the Medical College of Wisconsin, we have a 24-7 perfusion service, and we run, we check the, our patients every four hours or earlier or if it's needed. And we, with the visual inspection, we check for plasma leaks, signs of thrombosis, but don't expect only the oxygenator please go through the entire system. And we are gonna, I'm gonna tell you why later. Uh, we're gonna talk about the pressure drop monitoring later as well. And PO2, we run the PO2 postoxy every day. First, we hyperventilate the oxygenator. Remember to run the postoxy PO2 at 100% of fire 2 And the trend is more important than the absolute value. Of course, consider patient's conditions. If PO2 changes significantly, don't assume that ox the oxygenator is failing. Please first test the oxygenator using an oxygen tank. And during the pandemic, we experienced many, many gas blender failure. So every time that we had a huge drop in our post oxy PO2, we used to, and we usually run another post-oxy using an oxygen tank. In this picture, you can see where well, we run, of course, our post-oxy and still the three safety mechanism system that we have. We have a clamp on a perch line. We have a three stopcock and no vented cap. Um, on the next slide, um, I just, the bottom line of this slide, the message I want to, I want to send you with this slide is every time that you are going to run a post oxy, also please use a disinfecting cap on a alcohol pad because this is an additional access for infections. So, and because we run this post oxygenator or pre oxygenator every day, we, there is an increase of risk of infection. So every time that we do that, we also disinfect the access of the lure lock. Um, this is our uh, oxygenator change procedure, the perfusion supply, uh, what we need from the ICU nurse. We usually run this with two perfusionists or with one perfusionist and one ECMO coordinator. Um, we have to have a custom-made tubing system to only prime the oxygenator. We usually do not change out the entire system if it's not needed. So we only change 
the single oxygen adder. We prime the oxygen adder, and then we disconnect it, clamp it, and we are ready to change everything out. Um, these are the components that we need, but the most important message for me is if you start planning to change out oxygen adder, also plan frequent simulation or wet-to-wet -wet connections. This decrease the incidence of air in treatment and reduce oxygen adder change out time. Um, during the pandemic and right now, we are able to change out oxygen adder uh, in less than 25 seconds. Important thing, all many of our patients, as Dr. Durham, Durham said before, they work through our always, they had to they need to do PT. Most of the time they are extubated. So this is why it's really important to have a small, a very short uh, oxygen adder change out time because you don't have a backup system, essentially. You you need your CCA, your anesthesia, anesthesiologist bedside, yes, just in case. But if you're fast, you don't need anything else. Let's talk very quickly about the pressure drop. I know that uh, in the last years, there have been many questions about the higher pressure drop of the aerosex oxygen adder. Um, essentially, the pressure drop, you can measure the internal resistance. Um, but I, I remember, and, and the trend is more important than the absolute value, again. I remember many years ago when I was still in, in Italy, then when aerosets presented their oxygenator for cardiopulmonary bypass, um, I think Nicola Gelli, that now is the technical director R&D of aerosets, he had a very good, a different point of view how to design an oxygenator. And the idea was on, not only working on a, having an oxygenator with a low pressure drop, by having an oxygen adder with a low shear stress. Um, there is a general relationship between shear stress and pressure drop, but there is also a possibility to design an oxygen adder with very good performances and the lower shear stress. So, as I told you before, and you remember the slides, a few slides before, the blood inlet of the aerosex oxygenator goes 45 degrees angle with the base of the oxygenator. This is allowed to have a lower shear stress and have a better flow path to the oxygenator. And again, the last year's hemolysis is more linked to an adequate preload. So in case you have a patient with higher negative pressure due to a usage of small cannulas or having more suction events, this may lead to higher hemolysis than the shear stress or the pressure drop. We usually connect our Centromag system and oxygen adder um, to the CVH or other filter, plasmapheresis or a cytosorb. And usually all our connections are a pre-oxygen uh, adder. So we connect like the drainage for the CVH on uh, using the pre-connection uh, fluid system, and we reinfuse the blood on a pre-pump. Ensure that your device can handle these pressures and still perform wet-to-wet -wet connection. Use a flush, flush syringe and the alcohol pads. And if it's not safe to connect your CVH or any filters you have to the ECMO system, just use a different access. This is how we connect the CVH uh, threaded. Um, that's the, um, um, the blunt inlet for the CVH. And this is the infusion. Sometimes we have to turn this three stop clock a little bit to manage, to have, to handle our pressure. Um, last but not least, in the last year, with our experience with, you know, running many ECMOs, we experienced also some issues on um, handling emergency situation. In order to reduce emergency situations, we also develop an MCS safety checklist. Um, I found this very useful 
And we run this safety checklist every time that we transport patient to the CT scan or from a different hospital, or every time that we make uh, an oxygenator change out. Um, thank you so much for your time. And I'll give the word back to Fiat. All right, thank you so much, Flavio and uh, Dr. Durham. Uh, there are a couple questions in the chat and then of course I got some for you. Um, Carla wants to know how important is it that, that there is PC coding in a hit patients compared to I would say heparin coded oxys? Well, it's clearly important in a potential hit patient, um, the phosphorylcholine um is is a good hydrophilic interface um, that's non-heparin bonded so you know you're removing all heparin and since we use exclusively bivalrudin now um we'd rather not have any heparin in the system okay and then you know uh flavio you mentioned you went through some of the key components of the uh, AMG oxygenator. One of them was that stainless steel heat exchanger. Do you consider, or in your experience, is the stainless steel have any advantage compared to a, a, another fiber heat exchanger? If it does, then what would well, that advantage be? It's hard to say that it has any advantage or not, but I can tell you that we haven't had any issue to reworm patients. Uh, living in Wisconsin, sometimes we get some patient uh, you know, that had like snowmobile accidents and we have to reward them. And we had never had any issue on with the stainless steel heat exchanger. Got it. When it comes to um, the, the pressure drop, now, Dr. Durham, you mentioned in one of your earlier slides, there is a higher pressure drop with the AMG oxygenator. And Flavio, I know you went into that, 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 that higher pressures are up, that higher delta P doesn't necessarily lead to higher levels of shear stress. But did you guys see any increased hemolysis or experience higher levels of hemolysis due to that pressure drop? No, and we monitor um, plasma-free hemoglobins at least daily. And we've noticed no changes between uh, the McKay system and the AMG. The AMG's performed equivalent to the Quadrox. Now, while, while I'm going through some of these questions with uh, Dr. Durham and Mr. Cavallari, I encourage you, if you, if you do have any questions to, to look at the bottom of your screen. There's a Q&A tab or a Q&A button. You could leave your question uh, there. Uh, Paige Raymond wants to know, does the PC coding affect the degree of drug sequestering at all? Not that we found, and we try to take into account volume of distribution, uh, but we've never had the phosphorylcholine seem to affect us at all. Um, in a broad, just an anecdotal comparison, of the uh, two oxygenators that we're using. And uh, what, one of the things that uh, you mentioned was CO2 removal was what, what you looked at most, I guess, these days, Dr. Durham, maybe I'm paraphrasing that, that sentence. Is that another indicator for when you might need an oxygen, an exchange of an oxygenator, looking at blood gases coming out and CO2 removal? It is, and we're starting to look at that harder. We don't have a good hard and fast measure for it, um, but what we have found is that sometimes, you know, we were initially looking at just oxygen transfer and looking at the post-oxygenator gases, <clears throat> but we found that some, particularly when they were running higher sweeps, once you get a, once you get into sweep range greater than twelve to fourteen. Um, we found that just empirically changing the oxygenator, we would be able to drop the sweep 
from say 12 to seven or eight. So it clearly had an impact, even though we didn't have a real objective measure, it was more of a subjective feel um, to change it out, but it did have an impact. Okay, and Flavio, this, this might be a question for you here, a little technical question, but it comes has to do with um, air handling. And it, I mean, this is a question that would come up with any you know, uh, extracorporeal circuit, especially an oxygenator. The, the AMG oxygenator, does it have a hydrophobic membrane that can displace air if it were to get into the oxygenator while on the patient? And whether it does or doesn't, how do you and Dr. Durham handle uh, entrained air or trapped air? Can you elaborate on your experience when it comes to the air handling capability of the AMG? Yeah, so essentially, as I said before, um, we have very well-trained bedside nurse and a 24-7 perfusion service. So we go through uh, many simulations every year, several times per year, to where we simulate hair in treatment. Um, of course, we have never noticed any huge difference between the, how the Herald Sets MG or the Quadrox handles the, um, the hair treatment. Um, I understand that many people uh, consider, and um, there is an idea behind that uh, market, um, oxygenator can handle hair a little bit better because there is a, there is a hydrophobic valve on the other side. But I, I've been noticing that it's not, it doesn't work really great, or not at all sometimes. And I noticed this, that it was funny because when I, when I noticed that when I primed the oxygenator and you, the Makea oxygenator, and you put upside down, you're gonna still have a bunch of air in your pre-connection, generally in a, in a, on the venous side of the oxygenator. Um, the best thing to handle hair treatment, uh, to answer your question, Fields, is just to go through um, multiple simulations and create your uh, the best possible uh, protocol for your uh, for hospital service that you have, and um, and handle them at the best you can. We also noticed that because of the geometric configuration of the AMG. If we have any entrainment of air, the the oxygenator doesn't really handle it, but the design of the oxygenator allows the air to go towards the top where you'll see it pool in the top of the oxygenator um, rather than get recirculated to the patient. And so um, it gives us time to troubleshoot it, clamp it out and change and change the oxygenator. But if we get any degree of air entrainment, we generally will change the oxygenator out prophylactically. Thank you for that. Um, want a couple, just a couple more questions, and I encourage you guys to to submit your uh, your questions in the Q and A uh, before you evaluate that change out. As you mentioned, do you calculate VO two? Not usually. Usually, like I said, we'll go on post-oxygenator gas and we keep head and ears on the patient. So we've got near infrared um, that lets us know kind of how the patient's doing. And that goes a long way towards that evaluation. If we see the uh, head and ears dropping significantly and we have a significant drop in the post-oxygenator gas, then we'll we'll just change it out rather than go through all the calculations for PO2 or differential contributions of the oxygenator and the patient's own pulmonary circulation. And in addition, our patient, most of the time they're awake, extubated, so they can also you know, share what they're feeling with the nurse. And there's also another aspect to consider. Okay, so Mark Wante at uh, UMass uh, has a question. Have you ever seen issues with intravenous lipid emulsion with cardiotoxic drug poisoning? 
We haven't really seen any drug poisoning. What we have seen is the um, the membranes tend to be somewhat lipophilic. And if you maintain patients on high doses of propofol, it will, it will bind that to the oxygenator, which can lead to premature uh, change outs. It's not really a failure, but it will bind it. And you'll also find that uh, um, your critical care folks wind up going up on it. So we try not to run our patients on lipophilic drugs. We try to limit any uh, TPN contributions um, with intralipids or anything. We run more medium chain triglycerides. Understood. A uh, couple more questions here. When connecting CRRT to the circuit, did you have any issues with the pre-pump connection? Um, there's a little follow-up is, were you able to run it with all the connections post-pump and pre-oxygenator? Uh, so I'm going to answer the first question. No, we, of course, you may have some issues, but generally we practice in to connect the CVH. We have never had like major issues uh, when we connect the pump, especially that's the, based on the question that um, we received. Uh, the main issue that you may experience with the CRT is that you might have some sort of, there might be a risk of air in treatment, especially when patients start coughing. And so it, it's in, it increased the negative pressure on the uh, venous side of the ECMO. They may lead to some sort of air in treatment that most of the time, 99% percent of the time will be catched from the CVH machine. Um, in your experience, is there any difference in platelet consumption? Um, I think that I, my personal experience, no, I haven't seen it, but I don't know, Dr. Durham. Platelet, the platelet consumption is about the same across the board. We, all, we notice when we change out an oxygenator, when it's a fresh oxygenator, we'll see a drop in platelets, uh, you know, in the eight to 10,000 range, but it seldom is very dramatic. And we really haven't had any bleeding diatheses that we could attribute to an oxygenator change. All right, thank you. So in, you know, we're, we're hoping to wrap this up in the next uh, seven minutes. So I'm gonna give everybody on the call just a couple more minutes to submit your questions. But in the meantime, Dr. Durham, you mentioned earlier, um, you presented your results for switching to the AMG oxygenator uh, during the pandemic. So this was during and maybe it's a little after the pandemic. And you presented 69 patients, different configurations with no adverse events. Is Have you seen any adverse events or major complications since you computed or put that data together or more, I should say more recently, have you seen any uh, adverse events or complications? No, we've had, and you know, I was looking at that data again last night to make sure I was giving you current data and that data is good as of this morning. We've had no oxygenator failures, no serious adverse events. Um, we've had no bleeding diatheses attributable to any of the oxygenators. Um, so we've, you know, we've not seen an issue with the changeover. Okay, uh, a flood of questions came in. So have you ever had to exchange out an oxygenator when infusing factor nine? Not to my knowledge. I don't think we've, I don't think we've ever changed out with factor seven or any of them. Um, we've had, again, because we would consider that an oxygenator failure. What, um, and uh, Flavio, you, you talked about looking at PO2 trends versus just the absolute values. And this question, I think, is along this line. Uh, what, what factors uh, have you noticed in your experience that may contribute to a lower post-oxygenator PAO2 in the AMG? 
Um, my experience, I think that patient consumption, patient with septic patients might lead to um, a lower PO2, so it's not something really related to the oxygenator. Um, and you can just measure the pre uh, PO2, pre oxygenator PO2, and so start having an idea if the problem is the oxygenator or the problem is not the problem is the patient, but there is no issue with the oxygenator as well. Yeah, it's almost always patient issue because, particularly with the VV patients, you're you've got a mixing lesion, so you're you're mixing, and a lot of them, if they're again agitated, things like that, or if they're up working with PT, extubated, walking a lot, um, we see it fall just because their native cardiac output uh, bumps up with a relatively poor PO2 because their lungs aren't working, which is why they're on ECMO. Got it. And so I'm going to ask, you know, I'm going to wrap this up with a couple questions about, uh, there, there are about two questions here, but they have to do with the, the purge line. Now, Flavio, you mentioned um, primarily you guys will de-air, uh, clamp it off, and I know there are other applications that the purge line or the de-airing line could be used for. But the question is, have you seen any clotting that occurs in that de-airing pigtail or the, the purge line? Um, and does it pose any embolic risk to the patient? So I'm going to answer your second question. The answer is no, it's not going to pose any risk of embolism for the patient. And yeah, you might see some sort of clots on the top of the oxygenator. That's pretty evident. We we have never used the purge line as an accessory line, um, but yeah, there might be a presence of clots. But I my impression is that these clots are more close to the plastic side than the oxygenator. So it's just because where it happens in that specific side because it's where the uh, blood flow path changes rapidly. So there is there are these little areas where you're going to have um, a lower blood flow, essentially. Okay. And I'm going to ask one last question, and then I'm going to give both yourself and Dr. Durham um, just a moment for any last words or any key takeaways that you want to share with uh, the audience. Uh, one is you, you went through the process for priming and some of the tools that you need to prime the circuit or prime the oxygenator. Uh, can you can you shed any tips and tricks or best practices for the priming? Is it, is it an easy process? And then once primed, how long do you keep your wet primed circuits? So uh, if we're gonna prime only the oxygenator, it's very easy to prime. We, uh, we created our custom made priming kit, um, which I, I think of course is gonna be sterile and it's gonna take like three minutes to prime it. Really, it's super easy peasy. It takes a little bit more to set up the oxygenator because we want specific, we want to use specific pigtails or uh, um, we wanna connect maybe different things. So, but it's very easy to prime. So when you, for example, you prime the perch line, just clamp it and keep it closed. For, if you're gonna change out uh, the oxygenator, of course, we are going to use that oxygenator right away. Uh, we don't keep it prime. Um, at the Medical College of Wisconsin, we have one, one um, ECMO system set up, but not primed. And the second one ready available in the CVSEU primed. We usually keep it. Uh, our timeline would be 30 days, but we are never reached 30 days because we always have new patients to use it. So, but an expiration date for a prime ECMO system would be 30 days for us. Thank you for that. So I'm gonna, this time, uh, I'm gonna just, uh, I can start with you, Flavio, just any any last big takeaways on, uh, for, for the audience, you know, this, this was all about, you know, how you guys have adopted the AMG oxygenator um, I, I think the title of the talk is Challenging the Status Quo. So it's mainly about you've converted and are primarily using it. So just any key takeaways for the audience before we uh, wrap this up. 
Yeah, I think that in our experience, we, as Dr. Durham said before, we have never had any issues using the Abbott oxygenator. We and um, initially we had the same thoughts that many perfusionists or clinicians had. Uh, oh well, these other oxygenators working way way better. But we, I recommend to uh, every team in the country to just run a couple analysis and you can easily see that the performance are more or less the same. Um, there are, of course, some small differences like higher pressure drop, uh, things like that, that do not affect the uh, patient's outcome. Thank you for that. Dr. Durham, any, any last thoughts to close us off? Sure. Um, you know, as, as with any clinical situation, change is not always a welcome thing. And so we were, we were a little dubious when we started thinking about having to switch out our oxygenators because we were used to the quadrox. And when we started looking at the AMG, um, we kind of had a, kind of a bit of an acerbic opinion starting out, but I think, you know, once we got into it, did the kind of on paper comparison and then developed some clinical experience with it, um, it's very easy to use. It's very adaptable. Perfusion seems to like it. The ECMO coordinator seemed to like it. Um, I've seen good performance with it. I know one of the questions was about how it worked with hemosorption filters like Cytosorb. We were one of the original EUA centers for the Cytosorb trial um, and subsequently the drug sorb trial. Um, and we've used it with that oxygenator and it works very well. Um, we've really seen no issues. Um, it's a cost-effective oxygenator um, and we've had a ready supply of it. We've all, you know, so, it really solved our problem and we're we're very pleased with it. All right, well, with that, I am going to wrap this up. Uh, Dr. Durham, Mr. Cavallari, I wanna thank you right now for uh, sharing your insights and your expertise with us on the uh, AMG uh, PMP fiber oxygenators. I want to thank the audience for your engagement. There were a good number of questions that came through. And if you are still logged on and do have questions, please send them in. I will uh, do my best to get the get Dr. Durham and <laughs> Mr. Cavallari to answer your questions. Uh, we hope you uh, learned a lot today about the AMG Oxygenator. And with that, we're going to conclude the program. So thank you again. Have a wonderful rest of your day. All right. Thank you all. Thank you.